Hi there. We're going to start off uh, a short series uh, about books about the air marshals. And I think it's appropriate to start with one which covers the history. Um, at the time of writing, it was a 50-year history of the uh, air marshals uh, in United States uh, civil aviation. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I can remember uh, flying uh, during the time when there was no security uh, at airports or on flights. Uh, it was it was rather like going on a train, um, and obviously um, security was enhanced uh, following various threats. And the the book uh, that we're, we'll be looking at uh, follows that evolution. And uh, the the book is this one. The United States Federal Air Marshal Service, A Historical Perspectives, 1962 to uh, 2012, which is when the author wrote it. Um, it's written by Clay Biles. And at the time of writing, Mr. Biles was a Federal Air Marshal. And uh, it, it's quite interesting to, to um, discover that the first suicide attack um, where an aircraft was blown up in flight by um, a passenger carrying a bomb. It was in 1960, and uh, he, was, he was a lawyer. And around about the same time in the United States, there was um, a lot of hijacking to Cuba um, for various reasons, and President Kennedy uh, made a broadcast um, where to counter this threat, they would deploy border patrol officers on uh, certain flights. And uh, the program included uh, officers from border patrol, from US Customs, and from the US Marshal Service, and also military personnel. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about that program because it's covered uh, in detail in another book that we'll be looking at. But um, at the same time, uh, the um, as the threat grew, airports started introducing security. Um, first of all, um, screening using magnetometers and bag searches on um, a kind of a profile basis. Then it became a certain flight and then to what we have today, which is 100% screening. But the uh, principle is that uh, Screening is never going to be 100%, no matter how thorough it is and what devices they use, because by various means, uh, blackmail, coercion, threats, ideology, uh, you, you can get people working airside um, or within the airline air industry or the airline service industry who can um, help to get weapons aboard or devices aboard the aircraft. So hence the need for a uh, last line defense, which is armed personnel on the aircraft. And, and the book covers all that in, in uh, quite a lot of detail, which quite, quite a few first hand accounts. But as I say, we would be looking at it in, in another book. The next major change came after the hijacking of TWA flight 847 and um, that was, that was a, a quite a world-shaking event, lots of implications. And um, President Reagan issued a decree and um, to place air marshals on um, as many flights as possible. Now, there was some, um, while various responses were being um, discussed, there was some opposition to the idea of air marshals, but the kind of deciding factor was one of the um, president's advisors, Oliver North, who obviously became famous later or infamous maybe later, um, who thought it was a good idea. And he had actually been an air marshal back in the early days in the 60s when they put some military personnel on the flights. So uh, the, the FAA, the Federal uh, Aviation Administration, uh, w w w who have overall um, responsibility for safety of aircraft were given the job 
of fielding uh, a force of air marshals, recruiting, training, and, and deploying them. Um, and the way they did it was they took their civil aviation security office and gave them the, the job. And the uh, guys were on a rotating uh, basis where they would work most of the time um, in the civil aviation security aspect of the job, which was compliance with, um, so the airlines and airports were compliant with the civil aviation regulations, but then they would deploy, uh, gather together and fly as air marshals, almost 100% internationally. These are international flights. Um, a friend of mine uh, was recruited during that time and he told me he was a, a police officer in the Midwest and um, the, the, a, a buzz went round that they were, they were recruiting for a, a job and he, he went to a hotel for an interview with a couple of guys who, who kind of um, quizzed him um, about his experience, etc. Et and his capabilities. And then um, a while later, they said to him, right, you've got the job. Um, you, you know, pack up your bags and move. And he went, oh, hold on. He said, I don't even know what the job is. I hadn't even been told what it was. And they, they were a little bit more forthcoming. And he, he started flying. And uh, that's what it was like then. It was very, very secret and, and secretive. Um, I actually met um, Marcus's team in London. <clears throat> He'd been recruited into the uh, into the program. I, I he he he'd actually hosted our bodyguard course in Minneapolis. He'd been on the Detroit course, then he hosted the Minneapolis course. Then he kind of disappeared for a couple of years, um, and um, I got a phone call one day. Uh, it was a Sunday, and it was Mark. He said, "Guess where I am, Dan?" So I said, "Go on." I didn't know he was in the air marshals, and he said, um, "I'm in London." He said, but we're leaving, but we're back on Wednesday. Uh, do you want to get together? So I went down to London and uh, met the guys. And my first um, impression was they were the unhealthiest looking Americans I'd ever seen because these guys have been flying for about three weeks continually eating airline food and, uh, you know, with the jet lag, etc. And it was quite a hard job. Anybody who's ever flown a long haul flight will certainly appreciate that. Anyway, um, that, that went on for a while uh, and then it was decided to uh, slim down the concept and have a cadre of guys who were only dedicated to flying missions within the FAA. So uh, they, they changed the uh, methodology, changed the training, and um, they uh, started deploying on a, a rotating cycle of flying uh, standby and retraining. And they had three major teams to do that. And that, again, was all international. And, and during that time, they devoted a lot of time to training, uh, very specific training, and uh, one of the things they did, they trained with the FBI hostage rescue team and um, the FBI um, kind of became alarmed at the, uh, the idea of the marshals and um, put up some resistance. The FBI is very um, jealous, really, to be honest, of, of almost anyone. Their reputation within the federal law enforcement isn't a good one. Um, and again, questions were asked uh, about the air marshals, but the um, very high levels wanted them uh, to continue. And then another thing they did was um, they trained with uh, Delta Force and they, uh, to, to make sure that they were fit for purpose, they went through an evaluation phase where Delta personnel came down and uh, put them through their paces. And the conclusion was that the air marshals, this is from Delta, were among the top 1% of shooters in the world. So it was a very, very high standard. And one of their shooting drills, the tactical pistol course, was 
was a very demanding test. Anyway, um, the book goes into quite a lot of uh, uh, the missions they flew at that time. Uh, Mr. Biles has access to all the uh, statistics and so on, and how often they deployed. Um, and then the next, obviously, big event was 9-11. And, um, the, you know, they would not have been air marshals on the flights because their task was uh, international rather than domestic. It was on an intelligence-led basis. So that was a disaster which still has re repercussions now. The initial response was to flood uh, the flights with every... Uh, police officers they could get hold of uh, from all the federal agencies, the fish police, etc., and put them on flights um, as a stopgap measure while they put a massive recruitment and training program into place because uh, they were going to deploy thousands of air marshals. Uh, the book explains that there were problems with this, as you might expect, and the training was uneven. Some, because there were different uh, training teams involved, some people got one type of pistol training, another uh, other group got a different one, different qualification levels and so on. It was all rather rushed. Um, having said that, there were some really good guys involved, uh, both in the training side and, and, and who were recruited during that phase. And then um, the uh, whole thing changed when the... Uh, air marshal task was moved from the FAA to the newly created um, Department of Homeland Security and the TSA, the Transportation Safety uh, Authority, which took over airport security because one of the problems was that private security of the airlines, it was all done um, lowest bidder and um, security is always uh, getting, you know, in the way of making profits and so on. So it, there was gaping holes in, in, in that. So the TSA was created to try to have a uniform level uh, backed up with legislation and the air marshal uh, service, as it was now called, rather than program, uh, was put into the t under the TSA, became their Department of Law Enforcement. So um, <clears throat> massively expanded uh, field officers all over the United States and a much more uh, focused emphasis on domestic flights rather than the um, purely international flights. So um, that really brings the book up to date. Um, he goes into things like the weaponry used originally um, and it, the air marshal um, program kind of parallel the Secret Service in their choice of weapons, um, starting with the three fifty seven pistol revolver that they uh, originally had. And um, after um, 847, um, they were still originally using the, um, the Smith & Wesson revolver. They then went to the SIG pistol. Now, the book doesn't mention it, but they actually went to the SIG 225 first, a very compact uh, pistol and using the familiar, familiar Sigrun Sauer um, um, operating system. They carried that for a while. Um, an interesting thing, one of the guys told me that when they first flew into Germany, or it was um, uh, West Germany at the time, they, um, with the SIG, they, the German customers, whoa, 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 these are weapons of war uh, under German law. And they went, well, hang on, you sold them to us. They're made in West Germany. It's marked on the slide, you know, so sort of got over that hurdle a little bit. They then went to the SIG 228, um, like the Secret Service. And then later on, they went to the 229, which is a steel frame version, and went to the 357 SIG cartridge, like the Secret Service, um, which... Having fired a 229, 357, the idea of one of those being fired aboard an aircraft is quite a startling idea. Um, personally, and in my opinion, 9mm 
would do the job for what they do and it's a lot easier to train with you're going to have a lot less problems people qualifying and so on and um, because mainly what you're talking about is headshots anyway and a nine millimeter will do the job um however that's only my opinion the uh the book doesn't really go into tactics um for obvious reasons uh at the time he wrote it he was a flying air marshal so uh, you know discretion it's a covert role and discretion is um is, is very important so that, that that's a good thing he he does touch on the uh, after the um the, the service was stood up particularly under the dhs the uh, it was more or less taken over by the former secret service uh, managers um which has not proved to be a good thing uh but i won't talk about that too much because that comes up in another book uh, later on the book has lots of cases uh, of attacks on aviation throughout the world not just american ones but uh, from the israelis uh, kuwait and so on all, all the famous incidents the debrief on it the um the famous um air france um incident with the hijack which was resolved by gign um, and they actually sent one of the uh, air marshal instructors over to be debriefed by the french after it lessons learned which is a, a good idea to do um it's it's the only book really covers this um story of the air marshals does it very very well it's an inside view he's got really good sources um he wrote the book after going when he was going through the tr uh, as a result of going through the training where they did a brief segment on the air marshal history and uh, it intrigued him and he wanted to know more where it all came from and so on and he's put it together very very well and um, it, it stands as as the textbook on the history of the air marshals <laughs>